Welcome to this New Thinking for a New World podcast of the Talberg Foundation. COVID-19 is challenging some of the core principles of democracy. What does this mean for democracies in third world countries? Can values, integrity and resistance lead to just social contracts and robust independent institutions required for democratic systems? And what leadership is required from liberal democracies to support these processes? Alan Stoga, the chairman of the Talberg Foundation, spoke to Shahid Lalam, a photojournalist and activist from Bangladesh, who also featured as a Time Magazine Person of the Year 2018, about the implications of the crisis for what Shahidul chooses to call the majority world. Today we want to talk about democracy. Democracy globally, democracy in South Asia, democracy in Bangladesh. Even before this pandemic, there were lots of issues around the evolution of democracy and democratic institutions. Do you think that this crisis, this pandemic, uh, is the straw that can break the back of democracy as we've known it? Well, firstly, I don't think we had democracy in the first place. Um, We had an illusion of democracy. Uh, The implication of democracy is that you have a system whereby people can, through reason, through rational thinking, come to the right decision, which may or may not be in the interest of the majority, but but will be the right decision in terms of uh, logic, in terms of justice, in terms of the value systems that we have. That is not what has happened. Uh, That is not what's been happening, even in countries like the United States, where you have voting, supposedly. uh, You've had systems where populist decisions have been made and certainly in a country like mine where uh, we haven't really had a fair and free election for a very long time we haven't had democracy Uh, the coronavirus has exacerbated the situation it's created a situation where many of the previous checks and balances that help keep this system in place uh, have now been thrown out of the window Um, So we've now got uh, a situation where uh, pretty much the first person past the post can do whatever they want using this new demon that we have. There are certainly countries that are more or less democratic. You are, of course, right that voting by itself is not the definition of democracy, and, and, and that's often confused. It is an entire combination of institutions, of attitudes, of events uh, that taken together make a country more or less democratic? Well, one of the components that keeps democracy in place are robust institutions, uh, state institutions that play the role uh, of upholding people's rights. So we have the judiciary and which in principle, should be separated from the executive. You've got uh, the media, which is the fourth estate, and you've got a whole system of other institutions that play a very important role. Now, I'll begin with Bangladesh. That's that's where I'm from. That's my, where my expertise is and most of my experiences. Uh, in Bangladesh, pretty much all of those institutions have been uh, appropriated. So they're no longer independent institutions, and they essentially do the bidding of the government. Um, So you do not have an independent judiciary, you do not have an independent police. You've in fact not even got an independent educational system, which, which is horrific. So for us, the challenge really is in finding some sort of a mechanism where the public voice is heard. I'll give you A very specific example. Today is the 10th of April. Exactly a month ago, uh, one of our contributors, a photojournalist called Shafiqul Islam Kajul, was disappeared. He was uh, reporting on a sex scandal that uh, the ruling party, members of the ruling party, were involved in. uh, And he got picked up on the 10th of March. uh, and there's no sign of him since. Uh, the government's completely denied any knowledge. Um, there is CCTV footage of people tampering with his motorbike before he comes out of his office. These are people who are visible, they can be seen. 
the police refused to take the case. It's when the family took the case to the court and the court leaned on the police that the police finally took the case. But even so, nothing has happened. That's one situation. You had started by talking about uh, corona. Now, one of the things which we observed, and this also has to do with trust, and it's it's a question as much of perception as uh, as what happens on the ground. Often we don't know what's actually happening, but the perception that the public has is an important part of the equation. Uh, it is generally felt that the government did not respond to the corona pandemic because the 100th birthday of the father of the nation, who happens to be the father of the prime minister, was on the 17th of March. So you could not have had anything, uh, any bad news before the 17th of March. And essentially, uh, there was no bad news. The first death, interestingly, took place, or at least was recorded, on the 18th of March, 2020. And since then, we are trying to play catch up. Now, that in your country, you've had bailouts and they're being given to corporates. Some of it is also going to the ordinary citizen. In my country, 67 million people are in the informal sector. They are not employed in the conventional sense. Uh, they live on what they earn every day. Now, these are people who've not been taken into account. So when you've got a lockdown, when you've got people unable to work, you have people who are starving. Arguably, the social contract that exists implicitly between people and their governments in many places is badly tattered. You just described a situation in uh, Bangladesh where people are literally starving. We've seen images from Guayaquil, Ecuador of bodies in the street. Uh, we have heard of other cases around the world where governments have enforced shutdowns by gassing people. Uh, how do you think about a new social contract between people and their governments that will be responsive to the needs of the 21st century, that will be better structured than that which so many countries seem to be struggling with? Well, the basic premise of any idea of that sort is that the governed have a pr say in the process of governance. Now, in our particular case, it's probably not a fair comparison because we haven't had an election for a very long time. In 2014, uh, the opposition did not participate because they knew it was going to be a rigged election. Uh, in 2018, they did participate, but it was completely rigged. And the elections effectively took place the night before when the ballot boxes were stuffed. So that process obviously isn't going to lead to something. I think one of the things that has to happen is if the standard institutions are not performing, alternative robust institutions need to be in place which ask questions and hold the powerful accountable. Now, we haven't had that. So what we're trying to do is to mobilize public support for an independent voice. Uh, our problem today is that the media itself has also abdicated. You have, um, we've always accepted that state media will be propaganda. So I don't think that's something we need to worry about too much. But independent media, at least up till a point, had been on the side of the people or at least asked questions. Today, except for very few and significant exceptions, uh, private media is also uh, effectively an extension of state media. So that makes it very difficult. Now, we we're looking for ways to make it happen. Now, social media is still there, but that too is to a large extent being controlled. Um, internet access is controlled. Um, last night, there was a teacher who was picked up at one in the morning because on Facebook, she had critiqued the government's handling of the coronavirus situation. So you've got a very repressive environment within which space has to be created. But to be fair, there are people who are taking huge risks even within that um, space to do it. But I think there are bigger questions that also need to be asked in the sense that uh, these governments are not in isolation. They are in place because they work within an ecosystem where there is trade, where there's support and 
this propping up of many forms. Now we have a situation where this complete rigging of an election was condoned uh, by the international community, largely because I feel that our government uh, knew that if it met their agenda, it would be fine. So their agenda involves this supposed war on terror. It involves uh, delivering on the Rohingya situation so the Rohingya situation stays contained within Bangladesh and these refugees don't end up in European or North American borders. It also has to do with suitable trade deals. So we've got a situation where we have a repressive government in our own country. We've got the international community, which is perfectly happy to let business go on as usual. And it's the person on the street who gets screwed. Uh, there is no easy answer, but our answer is in mobilizing the public, in building resistance, in over time to create a mechanism where politicians cannot get away with what they do. And our way of doing it has been to work on three areas of intervention, media, culture, and education. And those are the three areas in which the organizations I'm involved with work. Um, Drake is a media organization. Pachella is a, a media school, a school of education. And we have a biannual festival where we bring in the cultural element. And our idea really has been through these three prongs to create enough pressure so politicians cannot get away with the indiscretions they get away with. What has been happening, fortunately, is we have huge public support. Uh, and that, I suspect, uh, is our answer, because uh, while they have uh, muscle, while they have money, we have commitment, we have integrity, and we have goodwill. And one hopes that that eventually will try. Let's slide back for a minute to the international community. Is there a distinction between governments, multilateral organizations, perhaps on the one hand, and civic society globally on the other hand? And the question, the corollary to the question is whether or not there is space for civic society outside Bangladesh to help accomplish what you're trying to do across those three dimensions you just described? I'll, I'll start with what you ended with. Uh, I mean, I got arrested uh, on the 5th of August 2018 because I was critiquing the government. Now, the government obviously thought that was something they could have gotten away with. But it was the international outcry combined with the resistance within Bangladesh, which was more difficult and more dangerous, but they did it. But it was this massive outpouring of support that made it far too difficult for the government to keep me inside. Uh, they refused me bail five times, but eventually on the sixth, they let me go. And I've continued to speak uh, since coming out. One of the reasons I can do that is because I know that there is this incredible support nationally and internationally that I have that, sure, I take a risk regardless, but I, um, I think it's a risk I can take. What would you like to see the global community, and by that I mean global civic society, do beyond the kind of outcry that helped you get out of jail in the past and keep suit we hope, out of jail in the future. What else can be done, a uh, thing that you described? I think there are two areas uh, which would be important. The first is to ask very hard questions of your own governments, make them accountable, make them transparent, and ensure that their dealings with governments like mine are based on values that we adhere to. At the moment, that accountability is not there. They get away with what they do. The other is to support institution building within countries like Bangladesh, to, to support organizations, to support institutions that are robust, uh, that are vibrant, that are prepared to walk the walk over a period of time. And I think it is that collective strength uh, which will help us overcome these resistances. There are practical things that can happen and have happened. I mean, 
quite apart from the support I was given, which helped me to come out. Um, I've also had people who've uh, offered legal support, uh, certainly moral support, friendship, all of that counts and matters. Uh, but in the end, the resistance has to happen here. Uh, and I think it is building the support structures that provide uh, the nourishment that people here at this end need. What happens generally is even within civil society, a, a lot of the things that apply have to do with you know, someone like me speaking good English, being well connected, being able to uh, negotiate those spaces, being able to uh, have a visibility at, uh, at high tables. But there are grassroots people doing extremely good work out there who've been doing it for a very, very long time who are not known to the international community. I think those are people we need to be reaching out to. Those are the people who face the greatest risk and those are the people who need most support. So it's a question of identifying those people. It's a question of creating the support structures or nourishing the support structures that keep them alive. Uh, it's a question of supporting people who are um, who work for garment workers, for migrant workers, for prisoners, for the farmers in the field. I think those are the people who will eventually rise up and bring about the change. I have very little confidence in the upper echelons of my own uh, society. To go full circle to where we started, the pandemic has clearly shown to anyone who didn't recognize it already, the fragility of the global system, the fragility of the concept of global cooperation. This has been every country uh, for itself, and the result we're seeing is clearly a mess. It could be that this crisis will show the weakness of democracy and the profound need to do something about those weaknesses and a recognition that weak democracies anywhere produce weak democracies everywhere. Firstly, I'd like to broaden the concept of democracy because um, let's look at something like the G8 countries, for instance, or the G20 or whatever. Uh, the leaders of these countries make decisions which affect the farmer in the field of Bangladesh. Yet the farmer in the field of Bangladesh never chose them as their representatives. So Western countries which talk about freedom and democracy uh, take it upon themselves to be the champions of democracy, forgetting that they actually represent 13% of the world's population. So until these global leaders begin to think for the wider community, for, for the global uh, population, they're not democratic in the first place. So while you might believe that you have democracy in your own countries. At a global level, to have democracy, one needs to be thinking of the global community. And therefore, world leaders need to be thinking far beyond their immediate boundaries. Uh, that is one. I would also like to look at value systems. I, I think there have been wonderful value systems which at one stage was shared. Now, as we built boundaries, as we built walls, when we create exclusion, when there's xenophobia, when there's fear of the external, uh, this, these, those value systems have also uh, been forgotten. And there is this perception that there are different value systems for different places. Uh, I'll give you a specific example. Uh, at the moment, uh, with corona now, in the United States, there are people talking about whether it's justified in uh, spending money on elderly people because uh, they're not going to live that long anyway. Now, that assumes, uh, or rather is generated from the fact that elderly people are not seen as economically uh, contributing and therefore not important. In countries like mine, elderly people are not seen as discards or as a burden on society, but as people who are receptors or receptacles of wisdom, of tradition, of heritage, of values. They are very, very important people within our culture and our society. Now, in our case, that sort of 
an equation would never come in because we value people differently. And I think those are things we need to be able to learn from. At the end of the day, it does come down, as you have just said, to leadership on the one hand and values on the other hand. That's indeed part of the reason why the Telberg Foundation is working in those spaces. And I have to use this as a moment to thank you for your engagement uh, with that effort. If we don't get better leadership, if we don't reaffirm our values, uh, it's easy to imagine that this is just one more downward step into something really quite chaotic and quite unpleasant. I, I would end with um, using uh, a metaphor because today we live in a world where everything is calculated in money terms, or at least in much of the world it is. Uh, and I would like to remind people that essentially in this globalized economy, uh, by forgetting the workforce, and not merely within your countries, but globally, the people who actually generate the wealth for the wealthy are the foot soldiers across the globe and largely in the majority world, the garment workers here, uh, the farmers here, the migrant laborers who have built these economies elsewhere. Uh, I think by uh, destroying their ability to survive, you're killing the golden goose. And it's very short-sighted. We are much better at short-sighted than long-sighted. It is one of, I think, our worst habits. Uh, we have forgotten history. We've forgotten values. Uh, we've forgotten how to think about where we want to be and do the things that will get us there. Thank you very much, Shahadul, for your comments and, and for all the work you're doing in Bangladesh and, and beyond. Thank you very much. Greetings to the listeners. Thank you for listening. Please check for other podcast episodes and video talks on our website, talbergfoundation.org. And follow us on social media to stay tuned for upcoming events.